So I'm Terry Vishwanath. I am the lead economist covering power, energy, and water at CoBank. We've had a lot of changes over the past year. Uh, you know, some of these changes in our industry, of course, are coming from electric mobility. And some of the exciting news coming out happen to be coming out of Ford Motor Company. We've got three speakers. We've got some quick comments we want to make. We're going to start off with Dave. Brian's going to give us kind of the big view. And then I want Boyd to kind of step in and talk to us about his experiences. So let's start the morning off uh, with Dave. Great. Thanks. Can everybody hear me OK? All right. Perfect. So um, first, thanks for the opportunity to come talk to you all. I really appreciate that. Um, it's an exciting time at Ford, an exciting time in the EV market in general. So I started working in EVs in 2009. Um, and prior to that, actually, the very first electric vehicle I worked on was in 1996, the electric, the hybrid uh, Saturn View, if anybody remembers that. So I've been around electric vehicles for some time. I am not an engineer. Um, my background is in marketing, um, but um, I've got a lot of uh, consumer research and dealer research and that sort of thing. Um, one adjustment to my role, I actually have uh, two roles, sort of. Um, so half of it is on the grid integration piece with uh, vehicle grid integration. The other half is in public charging. Uh, so I do a lot of work with our um, Blue Oval Charge Network, if you've heard of that. Um, so getting into it, uh, you know, Ford looked at the electric vehicle market and made a strategic decision to really aggressively pursue electric vehicles that folks want. Um, and, and that was a change in kind of the strategic direction, and it was a change in the investment, as evidenced by the amount of money that we're putting into the electric vehicle market. Um, the way this has manifested itself is we are leaning into our strengths. So think um, things like the pickup trucks, performance vehicles, vans, SUVs, those sorts of things. So we're really relying on the iconic nameplates as our entry into this. So things like your F-150, Mustang, Transit. Um, these, we're, we're doing this specifically because it then aligns with kind of customer expectations and it helps us move faster to make sure that we're delivering on things that customers want to see in those electric vehicles. Um, you may have heard recently that Ford has set up kind of two distinct um, auto uh, groups within Ford. So the electric and connected vehicles are part of Model E, whereas our deep automotive expertise still relies within Ford Blue. Um, the reason we did this is because as we look at the EV market, we realize we have to move faster. And so Model E is really around driving that innovation and really looking at how do we synergize kind of between the two. And, and we're doing that because as you look at other traditional OEMs, nobody's tried to set this up where you're able to partner off the two groups. And then, you know, startup EV companies can only, can only dream of the ability to do that. Um, so, is anybody excited about the F-150 Lightning? Any interest in that? All right. Um, <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about that. I got to drive my first one um, a couple weeks ago, and it's fantastic. It's, it's not like any other pickup I've ever driven. So um, there's a lot of excitement around this. This is evidenced in the fact that we've received 200,000 reservations from all 50 states for the vehicle. Um, there's two different uh, battery pack versions, if you will. So the extended range F-150 Lightning will get about 300 miles, depending on how you set it up. Uh, and the standard range will get 230 miles. Um, and there's a, three new things that I want to call out specifically that are brand new to the market. One is the Mega Power Frunk, the front trunk. Um, this has four uh, 120 volt outlets, two SUV or USB outlets um, in it as well. Um, there is the Pro Power on board with zero emissions. So this will put out uh, 10 kilowatts um, on, um, as, as part of the Pro Power on board. Uh, and then finally, the intelligent backup power. Um, diving into that a little bit more. So intelligent backup power is basically the system that working with our 80 amp charge station Pro will automatically use the vehicle as backup power for the house if the grid should stop serving electricity to the house. 
With the extended range vehicle, um, the extended range F-150, you can get three days of uh, power to the house. Uh, if you're doing some energy rationing and that sort of thing, you'll get uh, up to 10 days. We've been able to get 10 days out of it. Um, the system itself, so you need that 80 amp um, charge station pro. That comes with the extended range F-150 Lightning. It's an option for the standard range, but you have to have that start charge station pro. Uh, and then there's a home integration system that we've developed in conjunction with Sunrun. Uh, Sunrun is our installation partner for all of this, and they'll provide solar as well. Um, I want to talk about uh, integrating with utilities. Um, so Ford has a, a product called Smart Grid Rewards. Basically, Ford is part of a consortium of OEMs working on a product called, or working on a platform called the Open Vehicle Grid Integration Platform. That's in conjunction with EPRI as well. Uh, but it's an OEM-owned platform. What this platform does is it provides a single interface for utilities to be able to manage charging across multiple OEMs. And on the flip side, it allows OEMs a single interface to integrate with utilities as well. Uh, it uses standards, and in Ford's Smart Grid Rewards process, we keep all of the ability to manage that charging in the customer hands. So they can either take advantage of the incentives or the savings and allow their vehicle to be managed through that program. Or if they need a charge, you know, they can use their Ford Pass app to make sure that their vehicle is always charged when they need it as well. Um, I mentioned that I'm also part of uh, public charging. So Ford has developed the um, largest public charging network in North America. Uh, this is the Blue Oval Charge Network. Basically, we have access to 20,500 charge stations, 70,000 plus plugs, uh, and all of that is done through the Ford Pass app. So you can locate, route to, and pay for charging all through your, uh, your Ford Pass app. Um, Ford also looked at uh, better serving the commercial and government fleet markets. And so we've stood up Ford Pro, which is a, a, another um, organization. Um, Ford Pro Charging provides all of the charging solutions for depot, home, and public, all in one integrated and simple um, product solution for those fleet customers. Um, one of the things that we've seen is as fleets consider uh, electric vehicles, they, they look at the vehicles. They're not looking at the charging. And charging is an integral part of that, um, making sure those vehicles are, are doing the service that they want. And so it's really important that charging not be an afterthought for those fleets. And so Ford Pro Charging is, um, is designed to help with that. And really, Ford Pro Charging is part of a bigger solution set. So Ford Pro is set up to provide the full integrated solution, whether it's uh, vehicles, charging, operations, software, all of that is wrapped up into one big package with Ford Pro to make it a seamless, integrated, and simple solution for fleets. So again, appreciate you guys having me out here and uh, happy to uh, address some questions. Okay, so what we're gonna do is that I wanna have the initial conversation with the panel. I wanna hear from NRECA a little bit about what you're doing, Brian. So if you can take it next. Sure, Th thank you very much, Terry. Well, we're, we're not building cars and trucks, so <laughs> yeah, he gets the fun stuff. Uh, so at NRECA, obviously there is this thing called the infrastructure uh, bill that passed the Congress. Uh, heavy emphasis and focus on that right now. Uh, in, the, in the back of the room are a couple of folks from a company called Converge. Uh, NRECA has contracted with that firm to assist co-ops in grant writing process related to the infrastructure bill, whether it's EVs, microgrids, you know, whatever. Um, so that, that company is working with NRECA. We have vetted them and, and they're ready to help you uh, pursue grants on individual basis. At NRECA, we'll be pursuing grants where we're allowed to. Related to the infrastructure, the EV infrastructure, we have started uh, a community called the Community Approach to Vehicle Electrification. This is CAVE. Uh, right now we have over 400 co-ops in the last three weeks. 
uh, are represented in that network covering 13 million of your member consumers. And uh, these co-ops are ones that have expressed an interest in pursuing uh, federal funding, uh, ones that we are setting up meetings with federal entities uh, so they can hear from co-op staff directly. Because I'll tell you, one of the number one questions I get from uh, vendors and consultants and federal staff, number one question I get, why don't co-ops care about electric vehicles? I have a very simple answer to them, okay? Clearly you all care because you're here, and so there's a myth out there. And so this group is going to uh, work with federal staff to ensure that the co-op voice is being heard. But you know, really importantly, it is a community approach to electrification of, of transportation with these co-ops because it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's not DC fast chargers uh, plopped down on the countryside everywhere. Uh, some of these co-ops have a need for DC fast chargers. Others are doing um, public charging level two at places like state parks and museums and zoos. Others are interested in electric school buses, so working through the EPA program. And uh, we may have some model RFP templates that you can share with your school districts so they don't have to write this thing that they've never seen before so they can pursue, pursue this funding. Uh, beyond infrastructure, we are working on some other things. Uh, we have worked with a couple of co-ops, and uh, Dr. Gil Tall is in the back of the room, and, and Gil's going to do a session with me later in the morning uh, where he has worked with a couple of the GNTs to model their service territories uh, to look at where the EV growth is going to be uh, from your consumer members within the territory so those GNTs can um, manage that load from a power supply standpoint. They can direct uh, programs to their distribution co-ops are going to see a higher uptake. Um, additionally, we have a, a guy on staff that has created what's called the EV sniffer. It's in a beta form, but he can take your AMI data and find the EVs that you don't know about right now uh, that are charging in your territory by analyzing a couple weeks worth of, of EV load profiles. Um, and then additionally, we're helping co-ops on an individual basis with EV strategic planning because it's not the same answer for everyone. And sometimes, I mean, here's the really scary thing, it's not the same answer throughout your entire service territory. You may, you know, I'm a co-op member in Northern Virginia. I live in a densely uh, suburban part of the co-op. My part of the co-op looks very different than the more rural areas of Novec. So even inside of, of my cooperative, uh, you're going to have very different EV markets. Um, I can't leave my house and walk my dog without seeing at least, I used to say at least one EV. Now it's four or five EVs, just walking my dog for 45 minutes. That's the growth in my area. I travel a half hour, I'm not gonna see an EV. Uh, that's, that's, so it's, it's really about the planning and those are the things that we're focused on going forward. Um, and always happy to talk to anyone about those different offerings that we're currently doing at NRECA. Thanks so much, Brian. And now I wanna hear from the co-op's perspective, Boyd, I'd like to hear a little bit about your experience and, and pragmatic work you've been doing in terms of EV integration. Okay. Well, um, I do understand what all of these folks out here are concerned about today, and, and that's what does this do to the grid that we all manage? Where is this headed? What's the impact going to be? The industry that's coming about, the electric vehicle industry, is no doubt an exciting industry. The cars are really cool. They're fun to drive. The trucks are going to be game changers, without a doubt. But what does that game change do at the co-op level, uh, at the distribution level? And so early on at CK Energy, we decided we're just going to jump into it. And we're not necessarily promoting the EVs yet to our membership but we're gaining information uh, and understanding of how the vehicles work, what their impacts are, and different things like that. And so we bought uh, our, our very first uh, EV was a Chevy Bolt. Sorry, buddy. <clears throat> I would have preferred a Ford Taurus electrified, but they didn't have one. Anyway, uh, we bought the Chevy Bolt, and our intention was drive the wheels off of it. It's not going to sit parked. It's not going to be in the pool. It's going to be on the road all the time doing work so that we know uh, how far we can go. Uh, what, does, what does a strong north headwind do to you? What does uh, ice conditions do to you? We needed to know every aspect of driving an electric vehicle so that when our members ask us about it, we can, we can inform them um, uh, with the truth. 
But at the same time, we also determined uh, when I get home of an evening, I'm, I'm going to play like there is no such thing as a, as a peak. I'm just going to plug it in like I always would and, um, and see what happens. And so over the, uh, the first three years that I drove the Bolt, it was 103,000 miles, lots and lots of home charges, lots and lots of office charges, a few level three charges out on the highway, but not many. But anyhow, uh, we wanted to see what is the impact of the, of the peak and different things like that. And um, really the only time at home I'm ever on a peak charging was during the summer peak. Because in the winter time, when our peaks anyway, occur, it's normally a.m. in the morning. Well, the car's already charged. So I'm not, I'm not impacting demand at all. So really and truly the overall demand cost is only attributed at the summertime peak. Well, that's controllable, okay? So we needed to understand that. Uh, but then one thing I failed to take into account is I drove to the office and immediately plugged in on peak that morning. So, you know, you, you see that you can, you can shift, uh, you can hit your peak, but you can shift it from one substation to the other. It's still peak. So you have to take those things into account and, and that's, that's the kind of information that we have tried to, to uh, gain. Well, then Ford came out with the wonderfully crafted Mustang Mach-E. Uh, and my awesome boss, he says, we need to get us one of those. And so uh, I, I heartily agreed with him. And uh, we got one and, and I've been driving it now. And it's 34,000 miles of, of just a lot of fun. That's the thing about America that is, is going to impact us. Americans drive for pleasure. We don't necessarily drive out of necessity all the time. We drive for pleasure. His new Lightning pickup is going to be a game changer in that respect. In Oklahoma, 90% of the people have a pickup whether they need it or not. And it's because it's cool to drive. Well, how are we going to handle that? His new charger, the Pro Charger, is 80 amps. We're going to go in many cases from a 10 kVA transformer to a 25 kVA transformer or something like that. It's going to be an immediate six to eight hundred dollar impact to the co-op anytime somebody buys one of these. How do we manage that? And so that's our focus: is coming up with the way to manage that without having to spend millions and millions of dollars on infrastructure improvements. Um, there will be a definite place for battery storage and um, time of use rates and demand rates and everything that we can do to shift those loads throughout the 24 hour period. Um, but you can't figure those out unless you're driving these vehicles. So co-ops, if you don't have them, buy them. You gotta, you, you have to understand this stuff. And through our conversation as we were prepared for the panel, you know, some of the best questions, you know, Boyd, you start off with a really good one you had asked Dave. I want you to ask that same question about, from a co-op perspective, from, you know, what do you want to hear from the manufacturers or what do you need, what, what questions do you have for the manufacturers? Well, I think the, the most critical uh, question that we have of the manufacturers, um, every one of them are hopping out there and saying, uh, we're going to be all electric manufacturing by 2035 or 2040 or what have you. Well, that's all well and good, but how much conversation have you had yet with the people who own the grids who are going to have to manage the power associated with the charging of these vehicles? We're not against it at all. We just need to know how do we pay for it? How do we, how do we, bring all of the electrical infrastructure into play where um, the people that are actually use, using it for that purpose pay for it, but it doesn't adversely impact the people that aren't using it. Um, I would like to know how manufacturers are poised for the future to sit down with folks in this room and others to uh, determine solutions. Yeah, I guess, um you know, I don't want to pretend that I can speak for all manufacturers. So I'll speak from a Ford perspective and, you know, hopefully others are doing something similar. Um, you know, part of, I mentioned the open vehicle grid integration platform, and a lot of that is specifically for those conversations. So we are all the time talking to um, utilities 
that um, have interest in these kind of issues specifically of how do you address this. Um, you know, we, and I will say, um, you know, I can't speak for all manufacturers, but I will say there are uh, three other manufacturers that are in that platform with us. And the four of us, um, you know, talk pretty frequently, and that, and that includes GM, Honda, and BMW. Um, and so we are having those conversations. I look at like this event as part of those conversations as well. You know, from an OEM perspective, I think it's challenging for us because we often don't know who serves a particular customer. So we'll know that a customer has purchased, we'll know the dealer they purchased, but we won't know at all, you know, whether that, that dealer is in the service territory of a co-op or big investor owned utility or, or something else. Um, and, and so, you know, there's, there's kind of that two way street of how do we know who to tell <laughs> versus, um, you know, uh, understanding uh, how we how we talk to folks so we're just trying to cast a wide net um, you know I think the um, the ability to integrate with utilities to help manage some of that charging is accelerating those conversations but um, you know I, I spend a lot of my week on the phone with utilities frankly so I have a yeah can I just jump in? how important is it for utilities to understand the manufacturer's concerns and motivations because you want to make sure that the car buyer is happy. You don't yeah. want the car buyer to get a message from the utility. Here's the rules about when you're allowed to charge. Here's some things that we're going to do to make sure to control your charger. Now, we, we don't want you to use the four pro charger. You're going to use the charger we want you to use. How, how, how concerned are you about utility interference in your business? Because I'm pretty sure they're concerned about you interfering in their business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, ultimately it's all, it's all, um, it, it's got to be a customer solution, right? So the customer is not going to be happy with either one of us if we're telling them, hey, go out, buy this vehicle, but you can only use it in this way. Ford's going to get the brunt of that first, but it, it's all going to flow to the utilities as well. So none of that's going to work out to be a good situation for either of us. So I think, um, you know, we... Within the Smart Grid Rewards program, the way we've done this is Ford does the recruiting of a customer into the program. We are the face of the managing of the charging, um, but we're doing it all as in partnership with the utilities. So the utilities are actually paying the customer incentives. Typically, um, the utilities are um, the ones that are sending us the signals. So you know we'll communicate, hey. Your utility has said there's a demand response event. We're going to pause your charging, those sorts of things. And so we're trying to do it in partnership and make sure that, uh, again, the customer's at the forefront of that. The customer has the ultimate control because that's the unusual thing about this versus a stationary battery storage where you could potentially, or a thermostat where you can do demand response and um, you know change the temperature, those sorts of things. The, um, you know, if a customer goes out and the vehicle doesn't have any charge, um, it's a big deal. They bought the vehicle to drive it. Um, and if they can't get, you know, little Johnny to soccer, um, it's going to be a big deal. So, and, and, you know, the other thing that I think is really unusual is, so a lot of these folks, you, you always have had programs to take people from natural gas furnaces over to electric heat pumps, you know, natural gas water heaters to electric water heaters. And we gotta be honest, no rational human cares about those products. You do care about your car. Sorry if you do care about your water heater. Um, <laughs> don't talk to me at the bar. Uh, but you do care, people do care about your car. I think, Boyd, you hit the nail on the head. People love driving, they have fun driving. We sing songs about it. Man, how many Beach Boy songs are, I don't think about any of your product. Well, yeah, Thunderbird. Thunderbird. Yeah. Um, you know, Beach Boy's got tons of songs. We always sing about, about our cars. Um, and now, so we're electrifying something that people are passionate about and care about. And, and you have two entities, the electric utility and the manufacturer, that if they're not working together, if they're not talking, if they're not understanding the motivations of each, yeah. this is going to get screwed up. Totally agree. I think the other thing that I would add to that is, you know, not only do they not care about their water heater, they don't care about any of the language we use around electricity. <laughs> we're lucky if they can tell us who their electricity provider is let alone what a kilowatt hour is, what a demand response event is, like all of that, um, you know, it's gotta be a really fine balancing act of how we describe these things that we're doing to their, to their vehicle when they need them to be charging 
uh, and, and why that's important. Don't forget Mustang Sally, hello. So, <laughs> yes. So, you know. I think about every other country song is about a pickup truck, too, right? I, yeah. There you go, right there. So, I, and it's really interesting. We have limited studies on buyer's remorse, buyers who have purchased an electric vehicle and then are really unhappy and then go back to internal combustion engine. There is one study out in California, and it's largely what we find, not surprising here, is that those folks that are in apartment dwellings, you know, are, are more likely to go back to internal combustion engines. So it comes down to the charge, doesn't it? What they're paying, it comes down to the charge. So, you know, Boyd, you're the vice president of strategic planning. You were driving a car. You talked a little bit about you need to buy an electric vehicle and know how it works on your system. But let's talk a little bit more about planning. What are you doing to prepare for adoption? Uh, one of the things that we absolutely have, have to do going into this is figure out how we can um, manage our grid. And there's, there's going to be lots and lots of options for now to shift load from uh, peak periods to off-peak periods. Uh, and we're going to have to look at every one of those capabilities. We're going to need to, I, I think, I really think electric vehicles is going to uh, really bring to the forefront the fact that uh, battery storage in the future is going to be a bigger product for our industry than it is for solar and wind. Um, simply because we can trickle charge a large charging point th throughout the day and take that new pro charger out of our hair at, uh, at peak. Um, we uh, we have to have our metering systems where we, we can understand 15 minute incremental, incremental uh, usage throughout all hours of all days. We need to know, uh, um, we'll have to put together um, incentive rates, whether they're time of use rates or demand rates, because somehow we have to put the, the cost of uh, everyone's EV, we have to make sure that those, the people using them are absorbing that cost um, without penalizing uh, the others. Now, if we manage it properly, then all of those kilowatt hours that we're going to sell as a result of charging vehicles can and will support the, the people that are, uh, that are not driving the car. So um, it's it takes a lot of thought and a lot of study to figure out, uh, especially the rates that need to uh, be put into place going forward, and what are gonna be those infrastructural costs uh, that we have to blend into the mix. And I know uh, uh, Brian's gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but uh, that's the big thing is we've, we have to understand every aspect of our consumer's usage, and we really haven't for that, for that long. Uh, we're only now getting into the technology that, where we can uh, know and understand it. But now we've got to package the technology, and uh, that's pretty complex at times, too. It is. And you mentioned infrastructure, so we're going to move it over to, you know, Brian, I want to know about this. We have about 160,000 uh, gas stations in the country, and there's been a discussion around a half million electric charging mm -hmm. stations around the country. And we've got 7.5 billion. I want to hear a little bit more about, we've had a great conversation about community charging. So let's understand charging a little bit from the perspective, own it, where it goes, placement, that 7.5 billion, you, you had us off here. Yeah, uh, so on, on the infrastructure bill, that that's geared for public charging. That's your state department transportations in this initial formula program uh, that will get the funding and they're going to select uh, the hosts and the partners, and it's all going to be along alternative fuel corridors, or they're going to make new alternative fuel corridors. So uh, you, you need to really understand what an alternative fuel corridor is and if you have one in your territory. Um, anyone here from Alabama? Okay, you guys get the gold cookie. Your state was the first one to submit their plan. Now, this is like back in school. You, the state must submit a plan to the federal government, and the government's going to give you a grade, a pass-fail. If you fail, it goes back, and your Department of Transportation has to redo it. We've heard rumors. There's some states going, eh, this is too much work. I don't have time. Keep your money. Um, you know, you, you ought to be talking to your Department of Transportation you know, today. 
um, and looking at the alternative fuel corridors or highways that could be electrified. And that funding is, is going to pay for those charging stations. Uh, your, your states will really determine where this is going to go, where the, the ownership is going to be, and you know, really the, the role for the utility. What infrastructure does not do is, is really what Boyd talked about in the very beginning. As you get the, these higher residential chargers, and if, if Boyd's co-op or your co-op has to upgrade the transformer because you've got neighbors buying F-150s um, and, and going with that bi-directional charger, you know, you're on the hook, not the federal government. That infrastructure is not going to pay for that. Uh, so that's really where the planning comes into play. That's where the technology comes into play, uh, the energy storage, your other demand response programs. It, it, it really is, and what, what I recommend to co-ops, because we have a couple of, of products related to segmentation, to understand consumers. We're going to launch a uh, vehicle segmentation product later this year to get more granular into the uh, electric potential uh, for transportation within the service territory. But it's, it's not developing an electric car program. It's really developing a, a holistic program for the home that enhances your role as the trusted energy provider. Ford is the trusted vehicle provider, if you're a Ford guy. I'm not. Um, I'm between, I drive Toyota, so I can't even buy an electric, so I'm out of it. Uh, but I'm between two Ford guys. And so a Ford person, right, you're a Ford guy. Oh, yeah. So you trust Ford. Oh, yeah. If you're a Ford guy, you trust Ford. If you're a Chevy guy, are you trusting this dude? Yeah. <laughs> we got to be real, right? Yeah, all right. OK. <laughs> well, we'll, give, we'll convert you. Don't worry. Well, yeah. Are you going to start digging yourself out? No, 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 absolutely not. <laughs> you, you've got the brand loyalties. And so you know, the, the brand loyalty is with the auto manufacturer when it comes to the vehicle. The loyalty around energy needs to be with the co-op. So that means bringing a whole package, looking at energy storage, looking at smart thermostats, looking at the electric vehicle, how they interplay with one another for the benefit of the consumer and the benefit of the grid. Because Ford, Chevy, you know, you're all in this together. Yep. Um, now you want to win right. and you're first to market with a very impressive lineup. Yep. There, I've dug out my hole. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, in order for grid reliability and for the most positive consumer impact for your buyers, you need that holistic approach from the co-op. Totally agree. That's, that's part of the um, reason that I, I mentioned that open vehicle grid integration platform. You know, that's, that's fully recognizing that utilities having access to managed charging for a Ford vehicle is good but it's not the whole picture. They really need access to manage all the electric vehicles in their territory to be able to get the most bang for the buck. And so I'm, I'm right there with you. Ford is the best vehicle, but you wanna manage all of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Boyd, you gave us that a good example when we were preparing. You talked a little bit about, you know, the planning level, gonna get a little in the weeds a little bit about, you had a substation and you're taking a look at your peak and, and I want, I want you to kind of talk about that, how you're considering at, at, you know, when we think about, we've been hoping for beneficial electrification, you know, is this thing that any moment is going to happen. And now when we think about it and even the number in terms of adoption, um, as you know, as a, an economist, I'd hoped, you know, the number that people have been coalescing on is 10% of all new vehicle sales, 2025 will be electric. And if you take a look at what we saw in the fourth quarter, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we have doubled the rate of adoption. The number of electric vehicles doubled last year in terms of a percent, and we'll continue. We'll continue on. Yeah, I see you guys. So I'm. This is a really exciting. But you know, you've got to get into the weeds a little bit. Um, so substation, and and we're having a heck of a time with supply chain right now. But you know, that was a good example you gave when we talked a little bit about. And I'd like you to share that again in terms of you know what 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 keeps you up at night. Well, it's just kind of an expansion of the conversation uh, I started a, a moment ago uh, on our infrastructure worries. And my example was uh, we have a substation in uh, one of our communities, which is uh, heavily urbanized, uh, Mustang, Oklahoma, in the Yukon area. And uh, that substation is heavily residential. Uh, we've got probably about 3,500 meters 
in that one area and uh, the vast majority of them are residential. Well, we've got, I think it's a 20 MVA uh, transformer in the substation. And uh, at peak in the summertime, we've hit 17, 18 megawatts on this substation. Well, that's without electric vehicles. If we get a thousand customers that all of a sudden uh, purchase a, an electric vehicle, and that's not out of the question. If you think about it, a thousand out of 3,500, and that's just one car in a house of a thousand. Um, that's an additional, right now, just on a level two charger, that's 7.2 kW per charger. So I've just added seven and a half megawatts of load to a transformer that at peak already had 18 megawatts on it or 17 megawatts on it, but it's a 20 MVA substation transformer. That's where fuses go boom. And um, nobody charges, nobody bathes, nobody cooks, nobody cools their house or anything at that point, all for the pleasure of driving. Well, that is a critical question that has to be answered on all of our part is um, how far in advance do you have to plan for um, retrofitting your, you know, reconductoring, uh, boosting the size of your tra uh, substation transformer, asking for a neck, another transformer or another substation, which may be a five-year project or uh, even longer in some cases. So um, the understanding the management of uh, our load and different things like that, we can only put off the inevitable for so long before we have to change the big stuff. And so that's, that's the biggest question I've got on behalf of the co-op moving forward is the, the future looks wonderful. It looks like a lot of fun. We've got great videos of electric vehicles, jumping sand dunes and everything else. But um, the reality is gonna hit at some point and we have to be ready for it. Now, and that was part of the question I, I had for, for Brian on that seven and a half billion dollars worth of infrastructure, does that go anywhere towards the co-ops for reconductoring lines and things like that? Or is that just for charging stations and stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's gonna help support a charging station that's, that's installed. Re reconductoring an entire feeder, most likely not. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's gonna be that negotiation with your State Department of Transportation. And I, I think this is going to be, um, you know, one, one of those, I mean, we, we got to be realistic. The, the point of that project is to put charging stations out there in the public. It's not the reconductor feeders, but you do have to serve it and it does allow for the make ready. What I would say is, you know, the, the money that's there, seven and a half billion dollars, that's a lot of money. That's not enough money to do all the charging stations that a lot of folks want to do. So one of the things that um, we are recommending to co-ops is, you know, look at your feeders, look at your locations. Um, and if you have locations that are not suited for, for public charging from a utility infrastructure standpoint, let your state know that. Okay, that, that's almost as important as saying, hey, we have a great location here. We have a bad location. Don't waste your time and effort here. Let's do this in phase two, phase three. Um, you know, we're, we're working, uh, you know, both in, uh, so our lobbying regulatory team are doing an amazing job up on Capitol Hill. A lot of that language that was related to EVs and the infrastructure bill about making sure that utility make ready was covered was because our lobbyists were in there. There were folks out there saying utilities should get zippy doodah out of this. Utility is gonna make a ton of money. Government does not need to pay for make ready. Our lobbyists and some of the other utility lobbyists made sure that, that language was in there. So, uh, you know, if you see our government relations folks, you know, thank them. They, they did amazing work making sure that the make ready was covered. Um, but, you know, obviously there's going to have to be additional expenditures. There's going to have to be additional improvements. We haven't even gotten to the, you know, we're not even talking about the big things of the, the tractor trailers um, and the megawatt charging standard, which is going to have <laughs> chargers up to 10 megawatts each. Um, you know, you're not gonna plug a lightning into a 10 megawatt charger today. Uh, but if you had a fleet of transit vans, you might have a one megawatt charger and 50 vans off of that. So, you know, there are going to be some very large uh, challenges going forward. But I think, you know, 
when you look at technology and energy storage and that sort of thing, you might be able to get some of, but at the end of the day, it still comes down to wood in the ground and copper up in the air. What were your questions as we kind of gather our questions from the audience? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the questions that uh, we have is we do not know <clears throat> kind of where these bottlenecks are or the process to kind of identify these. So is there a way to better work with you guys to understand some of this such that, you know, as, as we're working with our customers, you know, we're right now we're taking orders for vehicles. Well, first we're taking reservations for vehicles, then we're taking orders for vehicles. And so, you know, we've got a number of communications that are going out and are there ways we can kind of tailor, you know, potentially, um, some of these conversations around known challenges, but we don't know the challenges. Um, and, and so it's hard for us to, to be able to say that other than to say, go talk to your utility. Um, and, and so just trying to understand like how that communication flows you know, in both directions would be really helpful. I think the other thing that um, I don't know about the co-ops, frankly, is kind of the, the process to get some of these programs approved. So if we wanted to do a managed charging program, you know, oftentimes we know that with uh, the bigger utilities, they can do it through either a research uh, funding that they have internally, or they have to go to their uh, PUC and get um, you know program approved through that. And you know, what's that look like for co-ops? Is it a similar process or um, is it faster or slower or those sorts of things? I think there's there's a lot of questions just kind of how the how the process works within utilities because we have some sense of that, but we don't have a complete picture. And that's helpful. So we're going to open up for questions. And also, if you can respond to that, those questions that Ford has, I would love to hear it. I'll do my best to speak up. Sure. So uh, uh, kind of, I'm kind of thinking about, you're talking about the issues that, that we're dealing with. Uh, for us, to, you know, if, if we uh, all of a sudden we have you know, I don't know how many electric vehicles that come on the system and we're having to do upgrades. Right now, probably the biggest issue that we're facing is just supply chain. Yeah. We can't get those transformers that we need to upgrade as it is just because of, of growth that's going on right now. I know Ford is really good about, you know, uh, creating assembly lines and things like that. But that, that kind of thing could help us out if, if, if somehow, kind of like you invested in an electric charging station, if, if you could somehow promote and, and make, make those things available to us, we can upgrade quickly and we can supply those customers and we can make sure they have a good customer experience for you. But in, in like a lead time on uh, large transformers for substations, those kind of things, you're talking year, it takes a year or more for us yeah. to get something like that back, right? So helping us out some way or, or another with, with, with uh, improving our supply chain issues would, would be a benefit. And the other thing I would I'd recommend too is, is you know, you're, you're talking about uh, some of the marketing and things that you do is, is just make that a big part when, when you sell these vehicles to your customers, they need to contact us so that we know exactly where we have issues on our system so that we can deal with it before there's a problem, not after they get everything constructed and, and then, then it's an issue. Uh, and that's, that's not, not so much a question, I guess, but just kind of answering, you know, you're, you're asking about some of the issues that we're facing. I appreciate that. That's a great comment. That, that's fantastic. And when we're hearing the supply chain issues, so early guidance, right? Perfect. Can I just ask a question on your on your second point? You know, if we if we have customers come back to the utility, I guess what's that from a customer perspective? What's that conversation look like? Because I think most customers will reach out to their utility if there's incentives involved. You know, oh hey, I'm going to get. $500 on a charger, of course I'm going to reach out to my utility. But if we just tell them to let the utility know, uh, I, I guess what what's that conversation then between you and the customer look like at that point? The utility definitely has to be prepared to ask the right questions when they call in because your frontline people may not, they were not going to autom automatically know, but they need to be passed back to our engineering department to evaluate probably in every case when, uh, to begin with. Most of the time we put it in a 25 kVA transformer and it's gonna serve two or three houses. If I have two uh, Ford F-150s that go in uh, on that same transformer, we're gonna have an issue. I mean, right off the bat, as soon as they, they, they install their, you know, their, their charging stations inside their homes. So I've gotta know that up front so I can get somebody out there to get that transformer changed out. I've also gotta have that transformer available for me when, in, when right now, like I said, uh, supply chains are, are thin. So most of the time, lead times on those even small transformers are a year out. 
So now I've got to replace that transformer with transformers I don't have. So you, you see kind of, kind of what I'm getting, mm -hmm. to, getting at, but we need to get our, our frontline people, we need to know that we need to get them transferred to our staking or engineering department so they can design around that. And I suspect a lot of that would come through the installer as well. You know, I don't think customers are installing an ADM charger themselves. I hope they are. Um, <laughs> as a trusted energy advisor, as co-ops, we're trusted. And you asked about marketing. You know, one of the things that you haven't mentioned is the two to three thousand dollars they're going to have to spend at their house possibly to get circuits put in to charge their truck. So if they contact me, one of the things I'm going to tell them is you better look at what you're, else you're going to have to spend other than buying just the truck. So how do you plan to structure your marketing campaign so that your dealers understand the other things these folks are going to have to do other than just selling them a nice truck? Yeah, that's a really important point. And Ford has uh, partnered with Cumerit for our 48 amp charger for installation. And we do point that out, you know, all the way through the process that that has to be installed and they need to find an installer to do it. Um, Cumerit would provide the estimate then for the specific home uh, and Sun runs the partner on the 80 amp for that installation, same process, they'll provide the actual estimate. But that's a great point that that is we do bring that up. We do point that out. Dealers talk about it. Um, you know, they don't have to use our recommended partners if they've got an electrician. You know, they can they can go that route. I was going to follow up on his. You talk about incentives for the member. You know, and your a lot of members are money incentives and stuff like that. But one of their incentives would be that they'll keep power. You know, they won't burn the transformer up and they'll be out of power for two or three or four hours. You know, uh, would be one of their incentives of you know trying to upgrade their system or putting their charger on a system and they burn the transformer up. Just yeah. following up on his right yeah. there. I totally agree. Okay. My truck's one of the older in the fleet, so I've already uh, let my manager know that I'd like to get a Ford. But um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the back feed issues is a big concern for us with any generating source. So I don't think we could underestimate uh, the talk of transfer switches and being careful with back feeding. I'm sure you're doing that, but I want to hear your talk. Yeah, I think that's why we've partnered with Sunrun. You know, they're doing solar installations and those sorts of things at homes already. So they have those transformers or the transfer switch, excuse me, and the, uh, the experience behind that. Uh, and, and so it is definitely part of that, that process to make sure the whole thing's safe and, and works the way it should. So I definitely agree, that's, that's a key issue there. Dave, to answer your question kind of from earlier, one thing that I would love to see, um, there are maps out there that can basically pinpoint any house in the country and say, this is your utility. Ideally, when they're doing the pre-registration for the F-150 or the Mach-E or whatever other vehicle, it'd be awesome if you guys could let us know who those people are, put it in the terms of agreement or whatever when they're filling out that application that your co-op or utility will be notified so that way we know who in our territory is signing up for these vehicles. And with these vehicles being a year out, if we know who's signing up for them ahead of time, we can do the prep work ahead of time too, um, to ensure that we're ready to go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's Appreciate an, ex that's an excellent. So in, in signing yeah. up about the time that that vehicle arrives, you guys have the heads up. That's, that's a super helpful comment. Mm -hmm. I think we've got one back room. I know that I will have an hour to talk, so it's probably unfair that I take the microphone again. And, and uh, Ford is doing a great job, but I just want to kind of one comment. Don't wait for the OEMs to give you all this information. I will buy my first F-150 Lightning uh, used, and most of your uh, constituents, you will buy them used, will buy them uh, out of lease, will buy all of them. So we need to find a system that is not waiting for the dealer or the OEM to tell us what will happen next year. We need to talk to our de uh, Department of Motor Vehicles to get this detail and to find a much more simple uh, data and let Ford focus on what they're doing best, building great cars and, and continue doing that. Yeah, that's the used car market. You know, how are we gonna get the heads up? So that's, that's a really good point. So Dave is gonna be with us today and floating around and I, I wanna make sure he has an opportunity to meet, you know, our co-ops. Um, we're also gonna have a continue the conversation at 4 p.m., the NRECA booth. Um, thanks again, I know it's a really packed room. I appreciate you guys standing up, so thank you so much.